Misha Talavo! Welcome to the Lepanto Institute's General Quarters. General Quarters is a naval term declaring an urgent threat to the ship and calling all hands to battle stations. Today, we're honored to have with us uh, Mr. Bug Hall. But, uh, but first, a few points. If, <clears throat> if you like what we're talking about here, please pass this video along to family and friends. Um, we're living in some strange times that we're pretty certain as there's some shadow banning going on. Uh, next, please hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to be kept up to date with all new content, make sure you hit the bell and the like button. Lastly, before we get started, uh, it's important to point out that we only exist because of uh, good, faithful people like yourself uh, who support us. And you can support us uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, the first is, probably the easiest, is uh, to donate to lepantoin.org slash donate. And uh, the second way is if you're looking for a great gift um, for, you know, for really anyone, family or friends, Visit our LepantoCatholicGifts.com uh, store. We have, a, uh, we have a beautiful Lepanto Sacred Heart Cross. Uh, actually, it, it really is. It's, it's a solid sterling silver. This was designed uh, by the president of Lepanto, Michael Hitchborn, and uh, he credits Our Lady with the, uh, with the inspiration of coming up with this. And, you know, actually, it's magnificent. And in fairly short order, we're going to also have a, uh, a wall decoration uh, in the same, uh, with the exact same uh, sculpting process. So um, anyway, it's, we think it's a magnificent gift for any occasion. We're suggesting that you get it blessed because it is a sacramental. And uh, without any further delay, I'd like to bring on uh, Lepanto Institute's General Quarter's first guest, Mr. Bug Hall. And uh, Bug, it's great to see you, my friend. Great to see you too. Thanks for having me. Great. Hey, um, Bug, a couple of things. I have you back. We had a lot of... Uh, we had a lot of positive feedback from that show. For the folks at home, you were a childhood actor and star, actually, uh, from the movie uh, Alfalfa, right? Yep. And uh, would you mind, um, you know, because one of the most pronounced things about your last appearance was we had a lot of feedback from people who were really touched by your, your story. Could you, uh, could you maybe just give people a, a quick background as to, uh, you know, you know, what your childhood was like, what exactly happened and what brought you, sure. brought you here? Yeah. So I, uh, I grew up a relatively normal kid in Texas and, uh, they had a big open call for little rascals. Spielberg wanted non-actors to play the roles. That was kind of the charm of the original show. So he went to all the big cities in America, uh, Chicago and New York and Dallas. Uh, and I saw a flyer for it. Uh, my sister was taking clogging lessons and they had a, a flyer up and I said, I want to do that. <laughs> so I cut my rat's tail off and I, I, uh, I put black moose in my hair and hot ironed up the, the alfalfa callet. And I knew the show because my mom ran a daycare out of our house. So I grew up watching it and I had been told I looked like alfalfa. So leading up to the audition, I would rewind it and play and mimic his voice over and over again until I got it just right. And I showed up and after multiple callbacks, I, I got the movie. So uh, it was kind of a whirlwind experience. I ended up in Los Angeles and we had two, three weeks worth of rehearsals. Uh, and I remember just being on cloud nine. I talked about this in the, the video I released in October. Um, that sort of came crashing down within a few weeks of uh, uh, beginning filming. Uh, two gentlemen on that set uh, began uh, sexually abusing me. Wow. So, and you were how old, Buck? I was eight at the time. Good Lord. Yeah. So, um, which after that video, I got a call from another one of the rascals mentioning that, uh, that he had the same experience on that set as well. So, you know, one of the things that, that these people do is they kind of compartmentalize it. So you feel like you're isolated and alone. Um, so I didn't, I didn't know anyone else had these experiences. I, I thought it was just me and that makes it, I think at that age, that makes it harder to sort of contextualize it and, and reach out for help. Yes. Um, so when that movie ended, I went on to another movie immediately afterwards. Um, and the abuse continued from project to project um, through various predators uh, over the course of multiple years. Um, I eventually 
did what most uh, children of abuse do, which is I, I kind of took on this rough and tumble persona. I think it's a defense mechanism. Yes. Um, you know, you want you want to look scary and dangerous, um, kind of like the, those lizards in the Amazon. They're brightly colored, so the other animals know not to try to eat them. You know, so you it, there's just this this instinct to do that. Um, the 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 scary thing is is it works, right? Um, and I don't think it's because anyone's afraid of you. Um, that might be your your motivation for doing it, you know, being young and not understanding what's going on. Um, I had a realization not too long ago when I realized that um, I think the reason that the abuse stops once you put on that persona and you really get good at that persona is actually because you're no longer representing any innocence, um, which wow. says a lot about what, yeah. what these these monsters, what their motive really is, right? I think the actual, the actual appetite, the actual desire is one of destruction of innocence, because as soon as you aren't that anymore, you're no longer preyed upon, you're no longer um, victimized in that way. So that's incredibly um, powerful. Uh, you know, the other thing that if, if I remember correctly, and please comment on this, and I was absolutely, it's something I thought about quite a bit after our first interview, I was really impressed by this. Um, as part of your uh, journey, for lack of a better word, you had an opportunity to call these guys out. And because you didn't, and I, I really felt that this was an, an enormous amount of integrity, you didn't feel that you could rely on your memory to call them out. So you didn't really push the issue. Is that fair to say? Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, we we all we all have an intuitive sense of the horror of, of, of that crime, right? Yes. Um, and the idea of anybody being accused of that crime uh, um, wrongfully turns my stomach. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. Right. And, you know, my memory is 30 years old. It's the memory of an eight year old, eight, between eight and 12. Right. That was about the range of the abuse. Um, and I. I I can't be certain, right? I, I, I've yes. racked my memory. I've gone through IMDB and tried to put faces to names and, and I, I've done the work there and I don't, I still don't trust uh, my own memory well enough. Um, I, I'm not 100% certain who was who. Um, you know, sure. when you're that age, you don't know any of these people's uh, positions on set. You don't know their names half the time. Um, you've got a hundred people coming at you from all directions, fixing your wardrobe and telling you to go here. And, you know, it's this big sort of beehive of chaos. Um, yeah. And the fear of, of accusing somebody publicly, um, wrongfully, somebody that might have a family, somebody that, I mean, uh, I, I, I can't, I, I just can't in good conscience do that. So. Um, yeah. An incredible display of character. And I, cause I think a lot of people would look for vengeance, uh, you know, sort of a scorched earth policy. Because yeah. given, given the magnitude of uh, the violation, especially to a child, and I, I really commend you on that, Bug. Uh, very Thank impressive. You. We had a lot it's, of uh, we had a lot of we had a lot of comments on that as well, and uh, you know, for people who saw you the first time, and yeah, and, it's been tough. It's been tough because a lot of people have reached out and said, you know, well, if you know, if if you were really serious about it, you would come out with names, and um, I just have to accept that sorrow. I have to accept that, uh, and just contend with it and uh, let it be what it is, you know. Which speaks a lot uh, to, if we could speed, uh, that's actually a uh, perfect intro, which speaks a lot to your faith. Uh, as Catholics, we're not expecting a perfect world. There are times where we have to just carry that cross. And, yeah. and it seems like you've embraced it, which, which, which I got to ask, it was sort of interesting. You met, um, you know, you were fortunate enough, you went to Hollywood, you, you met some other Catholics uh, who, and for and you met actually a priest who was an exorcist who had a tremendous transformative effect on your life. Yes, fair to say. And you know, even without going into too much, you were actually uh, not necessarily that priest, but you were fortunate enough to actually see firsthand some and take part in and pray in some exorcisms. Yep. And uh, t t if you could maybe just very briefly go into uh, the con your conversion story a little bit, and, and uh... yeah, so uh, my conversion was initially about eight years ago. Actually, eight years ago, um, here in a couple of days. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I came kind of right into a, a more traditional aspect of the faith, uh, the Latin mass, 
Um, I went to mass, you know, every day as often as I could. Um, there was always a contradiction between my faith and my work. Um, and I, I, I really tried hard to reconcile that. Sure. Um, and, you know, it was tough because most of the guys that I really respected and who really did a lot for me in, in my um, my conversion, a lot of them were would continue to sort of bring up that parable of the talents and, you know, this is this is what God gave you and it would be a shame to just throw it all away. Right. Um, and it's a that's a, a really logical sell, you know, that that sure. that made sense. Um, it's a it's a, a 30 year skill set and I'm in a position I was in a position um, that most people spend their entire lives trying to get into. Um, and so the mindset was, if I can use that for the kingdom of God, right, if I can use that to serve God, um, then uh, albeit for me not to. Um, after I assisted in some exorcisms, I suddenly had this this dawning moment when I realized none of that matters. Um, none of the movies we make, um, as great as movies are, as great as they can be, right? A Man for All Seasons, one of my favorite movies. Oh, yeah, right. <clears throat> you know, so movies can certainly be Catholic and inspirational and, and, and all of that. The industry itself, though, is is rotten to the core. Absolutely. Um, the way movies are funded, the way movies are distributed. Um, I, I There's not a single part of the process that um, is uh, absent of evil. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And I just kind of hit this point after after those exorcisms. You, you see the demons, and the thing that drives them crazy the most is that the priest kept reminding them that they were the means of this person's sanctification, that they were doing God's will. Wow. Powerful. And they would just lose their minds over that. And, uh, uh, I had this realization that that, that can be us, right? Uh, every, every soul in hell is, is probably tormented by all kinds of things, right? By the, lo the, the loss of God, obviously, and by the sense pains of hell, but also by the fact that, even against their own will, they did the will of God, right? Um, and I realized I just don't, I don't, I don't want that to be me. Um, yeah. And I said, you know what? Nothing else matters. All that matters is getting to heaven. Um, everything is just sort of straw uh, compared to that. Well said. So, yeah. So we made a pretty radical decision to just kind of unplugged from the entire system. And I went through a couple months where I was looking at other avenues and trying to figure out, well, what if, can I parlay these skills into some other career? Should sure. I just get a regular job? And everywhere I looked, I saw the same sorts of evils um, to, to at least a small degree, right? Participation in usury or um, uh, having to condone error. Um, and I, I I couldn't find something that my conscience could just settle on. And I finally, I finally had this, this moment where I said, you know what, maybe we just roll all the way back to the way our, our ancestors lived for thousands and thousands of years and try, try to do this in a, in a really radical and scary way, right? Just embrace that, the terror of going into the unknown um, yes. and, and not having this entire system uh, holding us up, right? This entire broken system that's antithetical to Catholic values. Certainly countercultural. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, let, let, let's, if I could, I, I'd like to frame this up for, for the next part and you tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that somebody like yourself um, has been to the mountaintop. You know, you, what I'm saying is that you lived in Hollywood, you had all the trappings, success, uh, adulation, uh, false friends or whatever, whatever car is money. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you realize that this is not this is not the way you, you, you go to life. Thir certain things happen and God put people in your life. Right. Fair mm -hmm. enough. Uh, yeah. Some of which were uh, some were priests. So really, and so, you know, you so you, you give your faith to God. Next thing you know, you wake up and go, I don't want any part of this. And yeah. so you do something that's counterculture. And, I, and I, this is the part that we're bringing you on for today. And we appreciate it because I, I, I just find this the coolest thing and very fascinating. Our culture is is one of paganism and idolatry. We 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 worship uh, material things, no question about it. Uh, your your value in society is is based on uh, two things, but predominantly the first would be money and and all the trappings that come with it, right? Yeah. 
And the second thing would be power and fame. Uh, I'm and, using it interchangeably. Yeah. So you had you saw it, which I, I, I the reason I love your story. You, know, you saw a path to go down and rejected it by your own free will, not out of necessity. And that's a key point. Yeah. You, could, you could have continued on that path. So yeah, I had I had just sold a show to Netflix, um, and we were in production on that uh, when I quit. So I had to, and that was a scary thing because I could be sued, right? I mean, you know, not uh, fulfilling my my obligations through to the end on that. Oh, breach of contract, absolutely, right? Yeah. So you know, but that was a it was a show that was going to be in production for another like year and a half, and I was like, man, I, I just I've made this decision. Um, and, and this is what, this is what I need from, from my sanctification. Sure. Um, and, uh, I do have to give them credit. They were, they were gracious enough to, uh, to let me, let me take that, that step back and, and not pursue legal avenues. So I'm a little surprised at that, but that, that is a wonderful development. Um, <laughs> well, I think when I released my video, I think it was sort of a mutual understanding of like, uh, yeah, you're not really, you're not quite welcome here anymore anyway. So we're going <laughs> to. <laughs> uh bug yeah maybe we're just gonna call it quits here but you know hey thanks a lot and uh yeah. you know if you need anything give us a call we'll do lunch uh <laughs> wow uh so hey how um so in this next video so I, I would say that uh you know you have you know as i said you you, you had talked uh eloquently about your relationship uh with a very strong priest actually there was some times like you did some construction work for him and they slept on his floor in the uh in the barn or something right yeah and, uh, yeah and I thought that was that was so cool. Um, and you, uh, how, if I could ask this, how much was the uh, your, I guess, witness and participation in the supernatural? I would imagine was a big part of this. Not to go into it too far, but I would say it was pretty, you know, pretty strong. Yeah. Well, you know, the uh, his his line of work uh, is an interesting one, right? And it's something that a lot of people have a. Uh, Maybe an, even an unhealthy curiosity towards sometimes. Yeah, great point, and the word would be unhealthy curiosity. I think I think uh, understanding it and a respect mm -hmm. of it is imperative. Uh, right. An unhealthy curiosity to go seek it out, you're out of your mind. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. Um, but it, it was interesting because just like with anyone else, when he when you're around this guy, uh, it's just shop talk, right? And so <laughs> he'll be just kind of going through going through these these stories. Oh, you're not going to believe this, uh, you know. <laughs> A bills above manifested, and you know this guy. So I'm just whacking him around, right? And you know, uh, it's it's it really implants that that sense that there's, you know, the 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 spiritual war is is paramount, right? And I think yes. because our culture serves mammon, I think we really are. Um, we really do. Even good Catholics tend to forget that supernatural aspect of our faith, right? Yes. In a, in a really whether it be Fatima or, or this or this subject, whether it be Fatima yeah. or this subject, this is. But go, please. So you know, you know going back to um, the, the the talents, right? Isn't it more if if we really believe that the supernatural aspect? Now, I loved my work, right? I I, yeah. I don't. I can't imagine anyone loving what they do as much as I loved what I did. Um, I love story theory, development work, acting. I, I, I'm madly in love with films. Isn't it more efficacious for me to let loose of that, to offer that as a sacrifice because it's for the good, right? Um, and and that detachment is going to serve serve the kingdom all the more, right? Um, ah, yes. You know, you, you look at St. Francis letting go of all attachments that's why he uh, is possibly one of the most meritorious saints of all time, right? Right, and worth mentioning was St. Francis, if I remember correctly, uh, was a man of considerable family influence and wealth. That's right. That's and, right. and so, and, and therein, therein is the sacrifice, you know? Right. Uh, go ahead, please. And so I, I, thi I think we tend to forget that, and, it, it, and so did I, right? It, it had to really click with me. Um, the more I was kind of going down this path of, of embracing sorrow and... Uh, focusing on where my attachments were, right? Why I could, why I could compromise um, in regards to my conscience when I truly don't believe I'm I'm a bad person, right? We all have that sense of like I I, I wouldn't do those sorts of things, and then you make these little compromises, and That's you right. have to ask yourself why, and it's because there's an attachment there, right? That same priest, by the way, he would use this analogy of uh, a dog with a rag. 
you know, your attachments like the rag, see, and uh, <laughs> and the devil. Once he gets hold of the rag, you've got the other end, and he can just pull you wherever he wants to wants to take you, right? Um, and 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 my love of my work was sort of that for me. It was why I could turn a blind eye when when you know uh, people would not pay what they said they were going to pay, uh, uh, you know, writers. And then I have to, you know, kind of act like I don't see it and turn the other way or why they could invite a child molester on set. And I just, you know, would have to kind of turn the other way. Sure. Um, and then you look back and you go, that's not me, you know, how, how, but it is. I mean, ultimately it is right. That the line of good and evil runs down the center of every heart. Uh, oh, right. and, yeah, young Ian shadow man. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Great point. Right. 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 And, and that's the reality is, is it's those attachments when we think we're good Catholics and we still find ourselves compromising um, yes. in regards to our conscience. It's those attachments. So I went down this path of looking at what real detachment is. And that's what led me and my wife to, to really embrace this idea of poverty. Yes. Yes. And then the, which is the next one. One last point though, before we move on to that. Um, it's, it's very interesting. And, and this is much like I've heard priests say, you want to check your spiritual growth, check out the, uh, the litany of humility, right? So you want to check out, uh, where you are spiritually. Cause I, I, I'm afraid I was guilty of that, uh, myself. I was a wall street guy and in the comment, you know, for me, the point was that, okay, you know, are you a good Catholic? Sure. I am. Are you really? Because I'm pretty invested in the cash and prizes and what my neighbor thinks of me. Yep. And, and, and what my societal standing is. And, uh, and that is a tough realization. And what you, what you so eloquently demonstrate, uh, I think far greater than myself, is that you, know, you were already at the mountaintop. And much like, and I'm not comparing you to St. Francis, but much like St. Francis, therein lies the sacrifice. When you can right. say, the, what's, the, uh, what's sort of the, the absolute fiat to God? And go, yeah, yeah, Heavenly Father, I will leave that behind me. And I'll, yeah. and I'll go in this direction. I, it, that, and I think that more than anything um, really affected people the last time you were on. So, so thanks again, Buck, for sharing this. Okay. And now let's, let's move on as you, uh, uh, as you transitioned. And I, I, this is the part I find fascinating. Uh, you've decided to, to go a different route with your family uh, that can be described as countercultural. I think it's fascinating. Tell us how you got there. And, and then at the end, tell us uh, what that actually looks like. Right. Um, there were... There were a lot of great saints that that I was looking at in regards to detachment. Okay, and um, they all had the the through line of poverty, right? Total detachment, um, and of course, as a family man, there's a, a certain incompatibility with that concept of total detachment. Um, but I, more and more, I was describing myself as sort of a radical extremist Catholic, right? I I I want I want to I want to see God in the face. The second I die, um, and I Great think goal. I think yeah, I, and it's it's just that simple, right? And so you look at the saints, and all of them were radical extremists. All of them said, you know what? I don't know what the line is. I've heard you know people. I've had this conversation now with a few people, and a lot of them will say, well, yeah, but if you just go to mass and you say your rosary, I mean, we're we're, we're guaranteed. That's it. If you say your if you say your rosary, go to mass. I don't know if that's true or not, but the saints yeah. acted like it wasn't. The saints acted like there was no measure too high, right? Um, yeah, I, I think it was Francis Francis actually you said, correct me if I'm wrong, work like it's all up to you and pray like it's all up to God unceasingly. Right. Yeah. I, I think it was him who actually said that, you know, so please continue. Uh, and, and that's, uh, so that sort of became my approach. I said, well, how far can we go? And me and my wife were really excited as we started talking about this. And we said, how far can we go? Um, and there aren't any modern examples of it really that I know of um, because our, our world is so, uh, it's so antithetical to, to Catholic beliefs, right? Yes. Um, and, and we said, well, let's just try something different. Let's, yes. Let's settle in. Let's see if we can get our overhead down to the point where we produce all of our own necessities, um, from our food to our clothing to to, to everything. Um, and let's see if we can get to a point where we are we don't even have to participate in the system anymore. Um, <laughs> and you know what's cool about that, as you dig down that, you realize that the reason you have it, you reason you have these these uh, pursuits of detachment is not just the spiritual aspect of it, but even in the temporal plane, nobody has anything over you. Nobody can threaten to take my job away 
if I don't stop saying what I want to say uh, uh, about the faith, right? Nobody can, yeah. uh, nobody can threaten me with anything. You can't uh, get I can, canceled. Uh, you can't get canceled. Well, you know, when you self cancel and you live on a farm and you you have no uh, no income really, then th there's no way to cancel you. So that was a big part of it, and that led me to look at all these other things, right? Look at families, for instance. Um, I think. I think families are a completely misunderstood concept in our culture now. Yeah. Um, you know, the, and it's two ends of the spectrum. It's children and it's the elderly. Um, on the side of children, I, I realized that all through history, children had the benefit of seeing their fathers exercise the virtues of their livelihood, right? The virtues of uh, bringing about um, order from chaos, bringing about, uh, the, the means of living that was required, right? Mm -hmm. And then you know, as the Industrial Revolution happened and as, as Catholic values slowly sort of dissipated in our culture, and this is, this is no fault of anyone, I'm not, you know, I'm not besmirching anyone who, who has to make a living, but what happened is, is we, we got to this point where people, men have to get up in the morning and they go to work. Yes. And it, even if they're virtuous men, they work really hard all day and they exercise those virtues. Uh, and then they come home and they're tired and they might, they still exercise virtue. They spend time with their family and they, I mean, maybe they play games and they do catechesis and whatever they do, but that's a narrow window at the end of the day, um, yeah. after the day is done. And that wasn't how people lived uh, for all of time. The children were in the field working with their father. They saw him exercising the virtues. Now they only see their father in his leisure hours. And so what does that do to the psychology of, of anyone growing up, right? Great um, I, I had the benefit. My dad was in the military, and when he was home, he was home quite often. You know, uh, when he was on a tour, he was gone for long periods of time. Right. But when, he, when he was home, it was, you know, uh, morning to night, work around the house. It was, okay, we got to build a shed today. Let's go. Sure. Um, and those were the most edifying moments of my childhood from, you know, for me getting to spend long days working hard with my father and the lessons you can't, you can't really articulate them because they're in, they're in the material of what you're doing. Right. Um, yes. These little, these, these little moral lessons and these acts of virtues. Um, and you're just sort of learning by osmosis um, rather than, than trying to drink from a fire hydrant. Don't you think, too, that a, a certain part of this is, and <clears throat> some people may take offense to this question, but I'm sorry. When you think about it, particularly for young men, uh, fathers are out of the home, if they're home at all, because mm -hmm. um, you know, the reality is half the households in this country don't have fathers. Right. And so uh, institutionally, a, a young man is in school and who is teaching him predominantly women. And so, you know, there's a, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, and it's something that I, I think is uh, demonstrable in the current society, that, there, that the, the male role model, particularly the father, has been devalued. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's another angle to this. There's the Industrial Revolution. And from that moment on, you know, men were out of the home, like you were saying, and they were commuting to work or to the yeah. uh, commerce center. And so, you know, talk about that, because you and I, I was so impressed with that. We were talking and your feelings on being around your children and uh, and, and and providing that sort of uh, example yeah. uh, and, and as well, can you talk about that a little bit, Bud? Yeah. So my eldest daughter's three, and um, she's she's out with me when I'm working. Right? She'll come out, and then she plays, and sometimes she's inside. But I'll call over and say, you know, come come look at the shed I'm building, right? And, and I'll show her what I'm doing. And, and I'll give her tasks that let her feel like she's contributing, um, you know, because ultimately I think kids fall away from their family units because we we're pack animals. Right. We, yes. we want we want a community. And if you don't feel like you're really part of the community at home and, and what is a family? It's a community. Right? Yes. It's the first community. Um, if you don't really feel rooted in that community you're going to find a community elsewhere. And if the value system in those two communities is incompatible, you're going to choose the community that you feel welcomed into. Right? And that's why teenagers tend to reject the values of their fathers, reject the values of their family for their, for their friends. Right. Brilliant um, point. And, 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 you know, it's funny. I, my father is a New York city policeman. I grew up around a lot of New York city policemen. And I remember one guy in particular said something I never forgot. Children need to be loved. If you don't love them, somebody else will. 
Yeah, and, and that's, that's what he was referring to, and that's gangs, that's whatever. But please, can, go ahead. Buck. And and love so often looks like um, looks like participation, right? And so, even though it slows me down in my work, I'm not in a hurry. Someone was telling me the other day, "Oh, you got to get one of those little bobcat things. It's going to help you get your work done faster." <laughs> and I said, "I said, well, the the point of me doing this is is to slow down. Um, right. I'm not in a hurry." You know, there's enough hours in the day for me to produce food for my family um, and, and to bring that about, you know, through through my land. I don't need to rush. And so my daughter helping me slows me down. But we get to spend time together and we get to talk and she asks me questions. And when there's a problem, we get to solve it together. Right. Um, That's great. And she and she wants to hear stories all day, you know, so <laughs> no matter what we're doing, you know, uh, um, you know, daddy, tell me about uh, when Jesus died on the cross. You know, she loves Papa Peter. Tell me about Papa Peter um, when he rejected Jesus and then he was sorry. You know, she loves she, and she just wants to yep. hear stories all day. And so so she gets to and I imagine that this was probably how uh, how our Catholic ancestors lived um, for all of time. Right. Yes, I, I uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in, in that sort of community environment uh, of like minded people and but with the family uh, as the center of, of uh, authority, you know, yeah. I, I, I met a priest once who had a very interesting uh, supposition and he, he felt that um, when Mary, uh, when Christ died and Mary had to spend her uh, months on Ephesus, I believe, the remainder of her life, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. if someone wants to correct me, I'm, I'm not a scholar on this, but he, he, was, he, had a, he had a supposition that, well, who else was there? And a lot of retired uh, Roman uh, officers and army on that island who had converted to Christianity. And when you think about it, uh, what a beautiful thought, you know, as they're protecting the mother of God. And mm -hmm. but also with their abilities, kind of like yourself, that they had developed in the military, they were building a community there of like minded people. And again, this was supposition, but I thought it was absolutely a beautiful ideation. You know, great. Well, and that's that's a great that's a great analogy for the other side of the coin in, in our sort of cultural dissolving of the family is is the elderly. Um, yeah. Right. You know, it's, Talk it's, about that. I, I had a realization. So part of our, uh, we're still working on our, our rule. I'm pulling from the Carthusians and from St. Francis and uh, uh, St. Benedict. Um, and uh, our, our, our pastor wants us to really define our family rule before we bring it to the bishop and, and, and take this vow. Um, part of it for us is no retirement plan. Um, yes. Which, you know, in our culture is shameful. It's shameful to not have a, a retirement plan. Yeah. And yet the retirement plan for all of history was raise good Catholic children and then burden one of them with you. Right. That was the that was the retirement. plan. <laughs> right. Uh, and God's math is always better than ours. And the beauty of that is, let's say you raise and I know everyone has different experiences with, you know, being able to have children and, you know, whatever. But let's just say for the normal, you know, you're what, seven to 10 kids or so, if you just follow the, the natural course, right? Right. So you put in the work to, to, to bring about seven to 10 lives and to, to raise them and to provide for them. One of them ends up caring for you. So that math still works out greatly in, in the favor of, of the children, right? Right, right, uh, right. But um, your your vision, which I loved, it was the coolest thing. We we had this conversation the other night. I, I kept you longer than you wanted. I always do that to you. Sorry, but because I, I love just, it. yeah, I find this interesting. But what you, I love this this what you said. It's like what what is this thing in our culture where where we we cast off the elderly to to the to the uh, refuse pile? Yeah, it's it's so it's so undignified to yes. to, to go off alone um, and die right and yeah. to, and to and to look we all need to be cared for in our old age it's yeah. and uh, there are pe paid people who will care for you but they don't love you no they right? don't um and even if they're really good people they can't love you in the way that that good children can love you um That's and so to powerful. care and to care for you it, it's it's such a dignified and it to me it looks like the natural order it looks like uh intentional designed by God, that final bit of humility for us after 
after providing for our children to then have to say, okay, here's a new thing I can't do now. Oh, here's another thing I can't do now. Wow, that's powerful. And to, and to slowly, you know, because you, if you're a man of virtue, um, you're going to continue to provide in every way you can for as long as you can. Sure. So, so it's still beneficial to the family unit, right? To have grandma and grandpa there because they're going to continue to help in all these ways. But little by little, uh, their abilities are going to slowly drop off. And that last bit of humility to, to get us over the, the last hurdle, let's say, um, is having to learn how to be cared for again. Um, you know, especially from the people who always looked to us. Um, for strength I still, and, and yeah, guidance. I, I think it's a really beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and uh, and then they also get the dignity, right? They get the dignity of getting to care for their parents and, and their children getting to see what that looks like. It's a oh. beautiful cycle. And we've, we've, We've broken that cycle. Yes, we have. Right? And so as we see all of these things and we can't figure out why are there no fathers in the home now? Well, maybe it's because fathers started spending less time in the home because they had to. And maybe it's because we didn't care for our elderly. And it's all a thread, right? Yes. Um, and, and as you start pulling the threads, the whole tapestry starts to come apart. And so my my goal is for me and my family to look at our, our home as this little monastery and to try and retroactively put those threads back together, right? I'm a big history buff, so I have the benefit of sort of knowing to a certain degree how people lived throughout history. And I want to try to retie those threads. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's at the very least, it'll be a beautiful experiment. Right. And, and, and you know, on that note, tell us a little bit, you know, sort of to wrap it up. But, you know, like, for example, I, I just think this is the coolest thing in the course of our conversations. You're building a chapel in your home. Yes. Right. But if that Absolutely. doesn't if that doesn't say something, you know, by the way, we're serious about this. And this is the center of I, and what a what a uh, what an example to your kids of formation. And um, so tell a little bit about, you know, if you could, the day to day, you're building a chapel in your home, which actually indicates what's most important and things like. Right. That. Yeah. So we'll start. Um, you know, the thing with poverty is, is you never know what's what's going to come. Right. And so. Um, and we donated our our life savings. Um, we tithe our life savings uh, to the church. So what comes will come. So first step for us is we're building a, a chapel. We're converting the garage into a, a dedicated chapel. We've got a consecrated altar stone that was rescued from a church in Bulgaria when the communists took over. This little old man, this little old man had the foresight to just pull the altar stone out of the altar. Uh, and hide it in his attic for decades and decades. Um, and his grandson, uh, 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 was, how was, did you find it? I mean, how did you come across this guy from Bulgaria? So, uh, when I first got married, uh, I had a solemn high nuptial mass, uh, and my wife was friends with uh, a priest in Los Angeles who, uh, he, he knew the, the new rite of the mass. And I was adamant about having a solemn high nuptial mass, which is, you know, the, the old rite, the Latin mass. Uh, and she said, um, father, father Chan, will you, will you, uh, be the efficient at our wedding? And he said, Jill, I don't know the Latin mass. And she said, well, you can learn it. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, so this priest uh, this priest went and learned the Latin mass in roughly nine months. In That's order a to, lot of work. It was a lot of work. So yeah. I, w I went down a rabbit hole trying to find altar stones because I wanted, as a gift, I wanted to make him a portable altar. They sell these, you know, they're like... Five to six thousand dollars. These really nice portable altars, and there's an actual consecrated altar stone in it. Um, but I had to find a consecrated altar stone. I didn't know and that. It, and in that process, I ended up coming a, 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 upon a second because I was just sending feelers out everywhere. Um, and so I ended up with two. And I asked uh, the priest that converted me. I asked him, Father, what should I do with this? Do, do I donate it? And he said, No. Uh, build an appropriate chapel for it and, uh, uh, you know, and thank God that you have it. <laughs> so it's, it's been, it's been in storage because we, you know, we were renting for, for a few years, but um, now we're building a, a, a proper chapel. Hopefully someday we can build in uh, a chapel that's separate from our house, right? We can actually build one at the back of the property, build, you know, with a, with a bell tower and the whole, whole nine yards. Um, yeah. Wow. Good. Yeah. So that's, that's our that's our ultimate goal. Now, if that doesn't come about, you know, um, then then we'll we'll be happy to have mass here in the chapel. 
this is uh, the first thing I built was this bookshelf. I had to get my books up somewhere, but yes. Uh, and by the way, it's very I, I, before the show you were showing me. It's really really nice. That's fantastic. Yeah, I I, I spent a lot of time. Uh, very early on, I realized that you know having hard copies of of really the the most necessary reading is crucial. I don't want to just catechize my children. When they have questions, I want to teach them how to find answers. So I want to be able to say, "Come on, take my hand. Let's go to the to the chapel and let's yeah. uh, let's find the right book. Let's go to St. Thomas and let's find the answers." You, you know what's cool about that as well, and I'm sure this occurred to you, but to point it out for for guys who are listening at home, uh, your library of answers is not subject to the internet going down. It's not subject to so you, there's always a hard copy. There's no problem with connectivity or, uh, God forbid, uh, some sort of scenario where, you know, there was, uh, there was strife around the community. You always have that. And, and I, I, I got to tell you, uh, Bug, I really enjoyed uh, hearing your story. I, I, think it's, I think it's the coolest thing. And, um, you know, you're a, real, you're a real example. And so, you know, you got any, um, got any final observations for the folks at home? Uh, you know, I... I I think that uh, you did such a great job of uh, illustrating, you know, what your new life is and uh, the value of it. But well, all all of this came about if, if you if you roll the sort of cause and effect um, back as far as you can on on the, the seed of this idea for me, mm -hmm. um, which ironically is the feast day of uh, the seven sorrows, um, and wow. that was that was actually the impetus to this all the way back. Um, I, the, the first and strongest devotion I had was to Our Lady of Sorrows. I did the chaplet every day. I still do the chaplet every day. Um, and I would challenge anyone out there, uh, if they, cause we don't know what our attachments are most of the time, right? We're just so blind. Yes. Um, and if you want, if you want to, um, be radically challenged and to take a really scary path as a Catholic, just start the Seven Sorrows Chaplet. Say it every day and ask Our Lady to show you where your secret attachments are. Where are your impediments to holiness? Um, and she will. And it will radically change your life. Um, so be ready. Well, what a great way to wrap it up. Honestly, that, 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 that's brilliant. Because I, I've often heard uh, very, very good priests say, or if I'm not mistaken, Our Lady of Sorrows is, is that's... Mm -hmm. That's the devotion to go to, to really determine your spiritual fitness, or in some instances, outside forces, possibly demonic that are bothering me. Yeah. Like that. And, yeah. I, and I think that's, uh, that's great. Bug, I, uh, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, thank you so much. Uh, it has been a wonderful catching up with you. And Same. I, I, yeah, and let's, uh, let's do this again. And I just wanna point out, you are our first guest, so that, that makes you uh, sort of, in the Lepanto Institute kind of royalty. So anytime. <laughs> no, we, I'm only kidding. We really, really appreciate it. And, uh, and thanks again, Buggy. Your, uh, it was a great conversation today. I really enjoyed it. So thank you, Ben. Uh, guys, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, again, uh, we can't do this without your support. So make sure you hit the subscribe and like button and hit the bell to be notified with new content. Remember, the online store in Lepanto Sacred Heart Cross is at LepantoCatholicGifts.com. And uh, lastly, consider uh, donating at LepantoIN.org slash donate. Uh, if, you, uh, if you can spare some of your hard-earned money, you can put us in that column of contributions. We'd appreciate it. But thanks again. We're saying goodbye to Mr. Bug Hall. has been a, a tremendous guest. This is Jim Mon at the Lepanto Institute. And until next time, God bless. Thanks very much. See you, Bug. See you. Bye-bye. And...